Hi, dear students. In this class, we are going to look at physics questions. That is, jam physics questions. 2021. Okay. All the 40 questions will be analyzed in this class. Hope you pay attention. We have done 2019. We have done 2020. Now we are doing 2021. If you have not checked those videos, please go and do. And also we have done for mathematics too. Okay? Please, if you've not subscribed, subscribe. If you've not shared this video, share it with your friends and loved ones. And I believe you're going to pass expressly. What you will notice is some repetitions. There are some repetitions you will see with other years, okay? Because just like questions. I believe you're going to enjoy the class, okay? Let's get started. Look at this first question. It says, the law of conservation of energy is represented by what? This was asked in 2019, also in 2020. I am seeing it again now in 20. 21. Don't forget, the law of conservation of energy is always what? Lear's law, okay? Let's look at this. It says what? In the figure below, the value of R at ballast point is what? Before you even continue, all you have to do is to first of all calculate the effective resistance of these resistors that are in parallel to make them work like this. And to do that, you agree with me, you have to say, 1 over what you are looking for is equal to 1 over 2 R plus 1 over R. That is 1 over this, 1 over this. This is what we are looking for. The effective resistance. Okay? We have done a lot of this in this channel. If you have not seen my videos on resistance, please do. Find the SCM. You have 2 R here, 1 here, 2. If you are a physics student preparing for JAM, I should explain this to you. 1 over R. So therefore, you agree with me to get R here, this R we are looking for is to reverse this, that is, to turn it upside down. It means we have 2 over 3 R. Okay, so for these guys now, we are going to redraw this. But in exam, don't redraw, okay? Don't redraw. Just for you to understand, that's why we are redrawing this, okay? So here now, I'm going to put 2 over 3. R, here is 5 ohms, okay? Then here is the galvanometer. Galvanometer, at this point, this is 60 centimeter, this is 40 centimeter. What next? The next thing is that we are told that at balance point, at balance point, what that information means that there is no deflection of this galvanometer and balance point. There is no deflection. Because there is no deflection, all we have to do, we have to do this over this equals to this over this. Or this over this equals to this over this. We can do that. Let's do this over this. That is 40 over 60 equals to this over this. 5 over 2 over 3 R. So is this R we are looking for now? Okay? Very easy. So what we first of all going to do, we cross multiply 40 times 2 over 3 R equals to 60 times 5, okay? If I cancel 5 here, 5 here is 8, okay? And you agree with me what I can still do here, I will do 8 times 2 R. This 3 comes to this side to have 60 multiplied by 3. This will give me 180, okay? Why this is... R. We just, okay, let me just continue. 180 over 8 times 2 to get R. So, you agree with me, 2 into this is 90. Cancel this 2. 2 here is 4. That is 45. So, what is remaining now is 45 over 4. 45 over 4. 45 over 4. So 4 into this, you agree with me, is 1. Into this 2 is 1 point. What is remaining here now? Remains 1. That is 2. Remain 0. That is 5. In ohms. Okay? That is 11.25 ohms. So as you can see, C is our answer. Okay? Let's look at this question. 
It says the area under a false distance curve. Look at this. False distance. It means we are going to have force here. We're going to have distance here. Let's put the area under this. What comes to mind now is how do you calculate this with distance and force? If I do FD, what is that? Force times distance, this area. Force times distance. What is it? Force, distance, work. So work is what? Work is a measure of what the energy you expended while apply a force on an object. So without be to without wasting our time, you agree with me that this answer is A. So no need to waste our time. FD. Work and the distance covered. Let's look at this. It says what? A charge of 30 micro columns experiences a force of 60 newton at a certain point. At a certain point. The electric field intensity due to the charge is what? Now, what is electric field intensity? Electric field intensity is simply equal to the force over the charge. What is the force given to us? 16 newton. Why the charge is 30 micro coulombs, which is equal to 60 over 30 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 6, because this is micro, okay? Raised to the power minus 6. Here 1, here we have 2, which is what? 2 over 10 minus 6, okay? Remember here, there is Newton, here there is Coulomb. You agree with me, if I bring these two down, multiply by 10, this you are seeing here is minus in indices. So minus, with this one that is already here, minus 6. This plan you are seeing here, where you want to introduce it like this, you put it as minus. Minus minus will give us what? Plus, that is plus 6. Plus 6, so we put this like this. We had Newton over Coulomb. So Newton over columns, which you can also write as this. So this is the answer. So the answer is D. D is the answer, okay? Look at this question. It says what? Dams are usually thicker at the bottom because of what? Dams are thicker at the bottom. They are thicker somewhere here, very thick. Why? The water pressure. Okay, now they are considering pressure and bottom. That is, talking about the height. What should be taken is that what is pressure in relationship with depth? Pressure is proportional to depth. So this H now is our depth. It means that if you fill here with water, the pressure will be less here. The more you are going down, it will be increasing. But pressure is inversely proportional to the height. It means as you are going up, the pressure will be reducing while the height is increasing. But when you are coming down, the pressure is proportional to the depth. So therefore, the first one says the water pressure exerted as strongest close to the ground. Yeah. They are strongest here because of that. You have to make the bottle to be very thick. To be very thick, otherwise it will burst. So, no need to waste our time. A is the right answer. Okay? Let's look at this. Which of the following pairs gives better quantity? Without wasting our time, you agree with me, power is not better quantity. Energy is not vector quantity. Even mass is not vector quantity. But these two, weight and moment, they are vector quantity. Okay? The moment of a force. Weight is a force in Newton. So this is the answer D. Let's look at this question. Is this what? An equipment which is this what? And resistance of this. We draw 
current of what? This is power. Why this is resistance? Now you start thinking, which formula bring this and this together? That formula is power is equal to I square R. We are looking for I, that is I becomes this over this, that is looking for the square root of this. So it means therefore the power given to us 1 5 over R, which is 375. If you divide this, you agree with me, you're going to have 4, that is 2 hams. Let's check none of this. Maybe this is a typo error, I don't know. Might be this, but as far as this is concerned, if I see this in exam, I will mark anything. Or let's don't know what you are doing. Because not marking it is also an answer. Okay? Let's see this. Which of the following gives white colors when combined? If you want to obtain white color, you must combine pure colors. And you will agree with me. Red, blue, green, they are the what? Pure colors. So no need to waste our time. C is the answer. Let's look at this. It says what? Which of these losses occur in a transformer? Let's list them before we even look at this. Let's list them. The first losses you will see in a transformer is the hysteresis loss. Okay? That is. The second one you will find is the what? The eddy loss. We have the eddy current loss. We also have the copper losses, copper losses. Then we have the strain load losses. Strain load losses. And finally, we have the dielectric, dielectric losses. Okay, now let's see here what we have. We have hysteresis, correct, eddy loss, that is eddy correct loss, have the strain load loss, very correct. We don't have mechanical loss. It means it's one, two, and uh, three, okay? One, two, and three, this is the answer. Why I listed them is, you might get to the exam, they give you copper losses, okay? It might not be these three. You might even see dielectric losses. They are all part of the losses you will find in what? In the transformer. Okay? Let's look at this question. It says what? What is the correct formula for the efficiency of a device? The correct formula for the efficiency of what? A device. What you must put at the back of your mind, if you want to get efficiency of any device, is always what to get at the output over the input. This is important because you might not see the question like this. They are giving us input over output. Some students will mark this. Output over losses. Some students will mark this. What if you now see output over input? It's also correct, but it's not here. But why output over input? Let me show you something. Assume the device is something like, say, whatever. You give input of 10 and you get output of nine, it means there is a loss. So this divide by this now to reduce the value. But if, for instance, you give 10 and get 10, 10 divided by 10 is one. That is an ID condition. It means this is 100% efficient. There's no losses. So it's always the output over the input. But now that we don't have this here, what do we do? The next thing we need to ask ourselves is, by the way, what is the meaning of input? What is the meaning of input? Now, with the diagram I drew before, if here I have 9, for instance, it means there was a loss of 1. Okay, this is the losses of 1. Let's say losses of 2, then this is 8, for instance. Okay, let's say this is 8, losses of 2. Here, the input is 10, while the output is 8 plus 2. It means that the output plus this will give us the input. Because 
Where I'm driving to now is that I'm driving to a situation in my because I'm already done with these two, but this one now there is losses, output losses, losses, output losses. I want a situation where this input is not here. What can I use to replace the input? It's because if I had this and this, I will have 10. It means this output plus the losses is equal to the input. Okay? To give us 10, right? So what we are going to do now, we do this as output over output plus losses. If I do it like this, as you can see here, these two cannot solve it for me. Please, you, you can't do this in exam because I'm explaining. That's why I'm just breaking it down. This one will not give me this. But I'm correct. So the other way I can approach it is because I'm seeing losses at the numerator and output and losses at the denominator, I'm thinking of what S can I do. Because I already know already now that the input is equal to output plus losses. Okay? I already know that input is equal to output from losses. Why not just save myself the embarrassment? I will come here now to look for output because output is not at the numerator of these two. I'm correctly considered. I'm correctly considering. So what I'm seeing at the numerator are losses. So therefore, I need a situation where I can remove this to have losses at the numerator. And the only way is to make the output. The subject of formula, say input minus losses. So I will come here now to replace this with, that is input minus losses all over input. Okay, now let's divide our seat. We have one. This divided by this is losses. Sorry for my ad writing. All over input. Okay, now that I know is 1 minus this. As you can see in this place, I have this ready, I have this ready, but I don't have this ready. What is input again? Input is what? 1 minus losses over output plus losses. That is what? Efficiency. You get it? So, as you can see, we are getting the answer here as D. So, D is our answer. Hope you understand how we got it. Thank you. Let's look at this. It says what? The inductance of a tonic circuit of an AM radio is 4 milliampere. Okay? Find the capacitance of the circuit required for reception at 1200 kilohertz. The first thing you need to do is to get the resonant frequency formula, which says that 1 over 2 pi, the square root of LC. From what we know here, you can see we are looking for C because that is what we are asked to get. And the value is in picofarad. Pico means terrace power minus 12. So anything we are going to do now should be targeting 10 to the power minus 12. So now we need to bring out L, okay? To bring out L, first of all, we cross multiply to have 2 pi F square root of this equals to 1. Then we are going to pull this, the Bible side by 2 pi F, 2 pi F. This and this will cancel. You agree with me that this will now give us this first, we are going to remove the square root, put it to this side. The square of this is 1, the square of this is 4, the square of this is pi square. Then we square this, okay? Then we bring out L to the other side to have this, that is the Bible side by L, okay? This time, we need to substitute. To substitute, you agree with me, C now is equal to 1 over 4 pi square. The frequency is 1200 
kilohertz square multiplied by health, which is 4 millihertz. The reason why I'm retaining this uh, unit is because of this K and milli, okay? Just for that reason, so that we not, it will not escape us. So I have this now. I have this one, two, zero, then one, two, three, square, then multiply by four, third power minus three, okay? I've gone ahead and solved this. I had 4.3976. Terry is power minus 12. You can do the same thing. So, at the end of the day now, we know that this is what? The pico. Therefore, we have approximately 4.4 pico farad. Okay, that is, our answer is what? Is B. Okay, our answer is B. Let's look at this. Mm. Calculate the time required to electroplate a substance of area 300 centimeter square, okay? With a layer of copper 0.6 millimeter thick, centimeter, millimeter. That means you have to cover one to one, okay? Now, if a steady current of two amps is maintained, okay? Assuming the density of copper is this kilogram per centimeter cube and the mass of copper liberated by columns is this. We are going to treat this one after the other. The first thing we want us to do is, first of all, let's calculate the volume, okay? The volume. First, what is the thickness? Okay, first of all, what is the thickness? Thickness is what? 0.6. 0.6 millimeter. This 0.6 millimeter, we can't use it like this. We need to convert it to what? To centimeter. This becomes 0 0.06 cm centimeter. Okay, the next thing I want us to do here is to know the area. What is the area? The area given to us is 300 centimeter, 300 centimeter square. Now, all we have to do now is to get the volume from here. Volume. So area multiplied by thickness, which is equal to 0.06 Okay, let me first of all write the thickness. 300 multiplied by 0 0.06. If you work this now, you agree with me, you're gonna have 80 meter cube. Okay, now we have the volume. Let's now calculate the mass of copper. The mass of copper. But first of all, what is the formula for mass of copper? It's volume multiplied by density. You agree with me that density is always equals to mass over volume. So to get mass now, mass is volume multiplied by density. Okay, what is volume? Volume is known to be 18. And the density is known to be 0, 0.0. 0.88 kg gram per centimeter cube. And if you solve this now, let's see, you will get 0 0.1584, okay? That is in kg. Now, we now need to get the total charge required to deposit in this copper. The total charge that is required to deposit in this copper. That's what we need to get now. So the third step now is to get the total charge. That is mass, everything, and mass per coulombs. What is this? We know 
mass per coulomb. It's like we say the minimum unit you will find per coulomb. It's like per square meter. So I'm building a house for instance. Per square meter is 20 per square meter. Then I say, what is 400 square meter? Okay? Mass per coulomb is known. We have to say mass over mass per coulomb to get the charge you will use to charge each. This is what we need to charge per mass. So, what is the total charge in the entire mass? Entire mass. We know per unit, but the entire mass. So, to get that now, we are simply going to substitute here. What are we substituting? We substitute the mass, which we already have, and also mass per column. A mass per column was given to us to be this mass per column. So now we have to substitute here. That is 0 0.1584 all over 3.3 to the power minus 7. Okay, let me get a calculator. That is 480,000. 480,000 Okay, that is a charge. So the next thing we need to do now is to get the time that is required to what to electroplate a substance of this area. That is the next thing now. So the fourth part of this journey, the fourth part is to get the time which is equal to the charge over current charge over current so what is the charge we already know the charge to be this over the current what is the current current is given to us to be what two amps two amps then we divide if we divide this now you agree with me we're going to have two four zero thousand okay that is what as per time in seconds. Okay, let's now check the answer. You can see the answer they are in hours. So put this in hours. You agree with me? You must first of all move it to minutes by divided by 60, further divided by 60 to move it to hour. Okay, so let's get a calculator. At the end of the day, we're going to have 66.67, 66.67 hours. Okay, let's go back to the question. 66.67 hours. Hope you understand this. Let's look at this. It says what? Which of these electrical instruments or machine does not rely on the magnetic effect of current for its working? This is something you should know without wasting time. It is carbon microphone. Which principle does it use? It works on the principle of variable resistance that is affected by what sound pressure, okay? That is variable resistance affected by sound pressure. Let's look at this. What is it saying? It's saying a 50 watt heat coil is used for two minutes to eat a Spherical metal ball of mass 0.5 kg and specific heat capacity of 1000. The temperature rise is what? The temperature rise. Temperature rise must come from temperature loss. Okay? First of all, we need to calculate the heat transfer. Okay? How do we calculate heat transfer? Heat transfer is simply MC delta T. That is, the mass multiplied by specific heat capacity and change in temperature, okay? Also, we must know that the heat can also be calculated by multiply power by time. That is to say, if you also want to calculate E2, you can also use power multiplied by time. That is PT. So what we are going to do now, why not first of all just get this one? We know the power to be 50. We know the time to be 2. 
minutes. Let's convert the minutes to seconds by putting 60 here. So therefore, this is 100. That is 6,000. Okay, 6,000 juice. Now, that we have done this, the next thing to do now is to look at this other guy because this is what we are looking for. Okay, so therefore, we can say these two are equal, right? So we can say this 6,000 is equal to this. That is MC changing temperature. So 6,000 is equal to mass is what? 0.5. Specific E capacity is 1,000, okay? Multiply by this delta T. So, with this now, we know what to do. Find delta T, the change in temperature, 6,000 over. If you multiply this now, you agree with me, you're going to have 500. Okay, this, 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 we cancel. 5 here, 1, 5 here. You agree with me, you're going to have 12. 12 what? 12 degrees Celsius. So, C is the answer. Okay, let's look at this. It says, a closed jar contains air at one atmosphere and 27 degrees Celsius. When the jar is heated to 127 degrees Celsius, what is the pressure increase? Very easy, simply apply the Charles law, which is P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. We make P2 the subject of formula because that is what we are looking for. It means therefore we're going to have P1 T2 over T1. Okay? What is P1? P1 is simply this one. That is 1 multiplied by T2. T2 is this. But this is in Celsius. We need to convert it to Kelvin by saying 127 plus 273 all over T1. This 273, we are using it to convert this Celsius to Kelvin. Then T1, as you can see in this place, is 27. So 27 now plus 273 as well to convert it to Kelvin. So all we have to do now, this one is 400. Why this is simply 300? This one is already out. So this is 4 over 3, okay? But this is not the final answer because we are told to calculate the pressure increase, not the new pressure, the increase in pressure. And you agree with me if we actually divide this, we're going to have 1.333 continuously. So the increase, we simply use this value minus what is just given to us. As you can see, this is in what? In fraction. So let us better leave it in fraction, okay? Because we need to be using the answer to guide where we are going to. It's like our map, we used to go to the next location. We are subtracting this one from this now. That is this one. We are subtracting it from this, okay? So at the end of the day now, what you're going to get is simply theory 4, theory 1 over 3, okay? You agree with me that 1 over 3 here is C. So C is the answer, okay? Let's look at this. It says what? A wire A is half the length and half the diameter of a wire B. Let's just pull like this, that this is wire A. I'm just drawing it big. Then this is wire That is A, this is A, this is B. Because just from diagram, this is half the length, also half the diameter, half the size. They use similar material. When you hear the word similar material, they are talking about the resistivity of the material. Resistivity at the same. Okay? What is the ratio of B to A? No problem. We need to, first of all, understand resistance formula. Resistance formula says that R is equal to resistivity let over area. Now, 
according to this, it says that if you want to get the length of A, you have to have the length of B. That is the information given to us. Also for the diameter, it says for you to get the diameter of A, you need to have the diameter of B. Okay? I want to ask you, if this is a wire, let's say it's a big wire, big wire, long big wire. You agree with me that what it's always what a cycle. What is the area of a cycle? This is the radius, it's always what? Pi radius square. But what is radius? Radius was not given to us. Diameter is always radius plus radius, which is 2R. Okay? To get radius, now you agree with me, radius is diameter over 2. So here, we can put D over 2, then we put the square to replace the radius. So it means, therefore, to get the area of A, the area of A is equals to pi R square. Instead of R square, I will do D A over 2 square from here. Okay? That is... This is the area of A now. That is this wire. If we want to relate it to B now, what are we going to do? We already know that for this is equal to this. So let's use this to replace this that is hiding here. You that is hiding here want to use this to replace you. So that is 1 over 2 this all over 2 square. You will agree with me, if we solve this now, you're going to have pi. This and this will multiply to have, because this needs to come down, to have this and this down. That is 2 times 2. Then we make it what? 4 raised to power 2. But what I want to do now is that I want to make this one d of b over 2. Okay, because I want to relate the area of a to B. That's what I'm going to. So I want to now pull this guy into two parts. That is to say, let me write it in another line. Look at what I'm going to do now. This is 2 times 2, right? This is still here. Because I want to get this over 2 square. So that this becomes the radius of B. That means this second two need to leave. But remember, two of them holds this uh, raised to power two. So why is coming out of this bracket, you need to, you need to apply this two on it to have four. So therefore, becomes this over four, like this. I don't know if you understand. For this to come out, because I want this one to represent radius for B. So you agree with me now, we can write this like this. I write it like this, right? That is 1 over 4 multiplied by pi. So I want to ask you now, what is this telling you? It's telling you pi r square. This is the r of b. The diameter of b over 2 is the r of b. So therefore, it means that this is the area of b. That is 1 over 4 area of b. That is now, the area of a is equal to one fourth of area of B. So this area of A, to get it, you have to divide the area of B by four. That's what we are saying. So the next thing we are going to do now, now that we know the area of A versus that of B, we are simply going to now look for the resistance relationship. That is, ROA now, resistivity, the length of A over area of A. Okay? Now that you know this, you can write this to us. What is LA in respect of B? Because we want to also get resistance of B. LA in respect of B, you agree with me, 1 over 2 of B will give us A, right? 1 over 2 of B will give us this. So we say 1 over 2 of the length of B. And for the area, you agree with me, it's like this. In place of this A, I'm going to put this, okay? So it is now 1 over 4 AB, 
like this. If you solve this now, you agree with me, you're going to get this. Here alone, that is 1 over 2 divided by 1 over 4, which is 1 over 2 times 4 over 1. Okay? And you agree with me, this and this will cancel to have 2. It means, therefore, I can replace all this with 2 to have 2 this over what I'm going to do now, I'm going to bring out these two to have two, bringing it so that you can see this clearly. What are you seeing here? What is that? Resistance of A is this. This is what? Resistance of B. So therefore, you can write this as equals to two resistance of B. See the relationship? The question says, what is the ratio of B, that is the ratio of the resistance of B to A? So, now that we know the relationship, now that the relationship is this, to this, B to A is what? That means B should be here, Y, H, B should be numerator, this should be denominator. So, we divide both sides by this. That is, this, this. So therefore, this is 1 equals to 2, this over this. So we divide both sides by 2, so that this and this will cancel. We know that now we have this guy over this equals to 1 over 2. This is the relationship. The relationship between the resistance of B to A. That is 1 ratio 2. Is there anything like that? Yeah, the answer is B. 1 ratio 2. Hope you understand this. Using what is given to us to get what we are looking for. I believe this is a revision class for you. You should already know resistivity, resistance of materials, and so on and so forth. Let's look at this question. It says what? In any machine, one, the velocity ratio is usually greater than the mechanical advantage. Very correct. The efficiency equals ratio of mechanical advantage to velocity ratio. Still very correct. The velocity ratio is independent of friction. Exactly. It's independent of friction. Therefore, this is the correct answer. Let's look at this. It says what? The accommodation of the eye is A, produced by movement of the retina, B, due to change in the size of the POP, C, produced by the action of the ciliary muscle, D, as a result of unbalanced diet. This is the answer. Produced by the action of the Slurry box. Okay, let's look at this. It says what? A ball of mass 500 grams released from a cliff 20 meters above the ground rebounds to a height of 5 meters. If the ball is in contact with ground for 0 0.1 seconds, calculate the force acting on the ball on impact with the ground. The first thing we need to do is to calculate the velocity before the impact. Okay. The velocity before the impact is simply equal to the square root of 2gh. Where is this coming from? It's coming from v square equals to u square plus 2as. Because the initial is zero, this is already gone. And you agree with me because we are dealing with height, this will change to g and this will change to h. So v therefore is the square root of 2gh. You understand? So that's how we got this one. So now, Let's substitute. This is equal to, we're going to use 10 for this g. The height we are told to be what? To be 20. It means, therefore, this is 200, 400. It means we have the square root of 400, which you agree with me, is what? 20 in meter per seconds. Okay? After we get this one, and the next thing we need to get is the rebound velocity, okay? The rebound velocity. 
So we're going to call that one the rebound velocity as equal to the same t, 2g h, but this time the new height. Okay? So what is the new height from this question? The new height is this. So this is equal to square root of 2 times 10 multiplied by 5, which is 100, which is 10 in meter per seconds. Okay? The next thing we need to do now is to calculate the total change in velocity. So the total change in velocity from this now is equal to V plus this, which is equal to 20 plus 10, equals to 30 in meter per seconds. Now that we know the change in velocity, all we have to do to get the force, that is the force, to so say this is equal to m, the mass multiplied by change in velocity over t. What am I doing? I'm simply say m a. Okay? But what is a? a is always v over t. But what is actually t in this context? It's change in v over t. Okay? So therefore, we can put now the mass is what? 500 grams. That is 0.5 kg multiplied by 30 over how many seconds? The seconds given to us is 0.1. Okay? So therefore, you agree with me, this one will come here, this one will come here. 5 multiplied by 30 is going to give us 150. That is to say, 150 newton. Is there anything like 150 newton here? Yeah, 150 newton is number C. Okay? That is the answer. Hope you understand this. Let's look at this. It says a vibrating string has a tension of 40 newton. I produce a note of 200 hairs. Where plug in the middle, the length of the string is halved. And the tension is increased by 120 newton. Then the new frequency becomes. One thing you must put at the back of your mind is that. Frequency is proportional to the square root of the tension, okay? Frequency is proportional to the square root of what? Tension, okay? So with this now, all we have to do is to know that F2 over F1 is equal to the square root of T2 over T1. We are looking for F2. So all we need to do is to substitute. Before we substitute, let's investigate some certain things. We are looking for F2. We don't know F2. For the F1, as you can see, it is 200 hertz. 200 hertz. Then, for the T1, you agree with me, it was given to us to be 40 newton. 40 newton. And... For us to get the T2, this way many students will miss it. And the tension increased by this, increased by. It means you increase T1 by 120. You have to add it to it. Meaning, let's do it here, 40 plus 120, which is 160 Newton. So therefore, if you come back here now, I say F2 over, this F1 is 200, equal to the square root of T2, that is 100, over 40, okay? This 160, 160 over 40. This 4, square root of 4 is 2. So therefore, this over 200 is equal to 2. You agree with me, F2 now is equal to 200 times 2, which is 400 hertz. Is there anything like 400? Yes, D is our answer. Okay? Let's look at this. It says, a parallel arrangement of 3 ohms and 6 ohm resistors is placed in series with 8 ohm resistor. That is... 3 ohms and uh, 6 ohms 
they are placed in parallel like this. Okay? Place a series with another one of 8 ohms. Okay? If potential difference of 30 volt, that is, here, is connected across everything, what current passes through here? The first thing you need to do is, we get here the effective resistor. Because they are in parallel, all we have to do, say 1 over R, what we are looking for is equals to 1 over 3 plus 1 over 6. That is C2 plus 1 equals to 3 over 6. Here 1, here 2, that is 1 over 2. So 1 over R is equals to 1 over 2. You agree with me at the end of the day, R is equals to 2, okay? It means what these guys have given to us is 2. You can redraw it, but in exam all, you don't need to redraw because when you redraw, you are burning your time. You have this now at the back of your hands that what these guys are producing is 2 ohms. This one is just to help us to get the current coming in here. Now that we know that this is 2 ohms, we add these two together. Because these two are now in series, series connection. So because they are in series connection, it's now 2 plus 8, which is 10. So it means now the new effective resistance for, for everything before us is 10. So this is 10 ohms. This is 30 volt. So what is current? Current is actually V over R. So total V is 30, total R is 10. It means at the end of the day, we have 3 ampere as our current. Now that we have done that, we now need to calculate the voltage coming for this. That is, because these two are in series, this group and this group are in series, the voltage here at this ends is equal. It means this guy and this guy, they are maintaining the same voltage. So this one has its own voltage. So this group versus this are sharing this. To know what this one is taking, we do V equals to RR. What is the R? This is the R because when this comes here, it divides into two. One come here, one come here before coming here. Everything we pass through here, the entire three ampere we pass through this. This will give us what? 24. 24 volt. So it means this one alone is collecting 24 volt from here. What is now remaining? Once you remove 24 from here, 6 will now be remaining for these two. Okay? It means these guys now, they are sharing 6 volt. So if you connect 6 volt across here, it means the voltage of this is 6 volt. The voltage of this is 6 volt. So now that we know the voltage of this to be 6 volt, to get this current, we say V over R, 6 volt is here, and the R we are given is 3, it means here is 2. What is this? The answer is D. Let's look at this. It says what? A 60 watt and 120 watt domestic lamp. Domestic lamps are used on the 240 volt maze. Which of the following statements? Is correct. A. The filament of the 120 watt lamp has higher resistance than that of 60 watt lamp. The total current through me is 1 amp. The potential difference across each is 120 volt. The filament of the 60 watt lamp has higher resistance than that of the 120 watt lamp. For me, I will concentrate on these two because, because of this repetition of comparison of resistance, we have to do some calculation because figures are given to us to now do the comparison. That means we need to calculate for this and this because they are two different labs, all with 240 volt me, which of the following statement is correct. All you need to do, the power dissipated, power dissipated is always V squared over R, okay? That is power dissipated. Now we are given power, we are given voltage. So we need to get R. So we can just bring R here as a V square over P. I will know that this is 240, it's constant. The only thing that is changing is this and this. We're going to put 60 here now. So that is for the first one. 
we're going to do for the second one too. That is, for the second one, we need to write the formula. It's T240 over 120. Okay? So now, we can use calculator to solve this very fast without wasting our time. Okay? For this, it's 960. For this second one, it's 480. Okay, now let's compare the first versus second one. Okay? So you can see, you can even say that the power is inversely proportional to the resistance. It means the lower the resistance, the higher the power. So the higher the power, the lesser the resistance. So with this now, we can say this one has lower resistance. So you can see here, 480. For the 120, 480 for this, why this is 960. So which one has higher resistance? This has higher resistance than this. It means the filament of this has higher resistance than that of this. So therefore, D is our answer. Okay? Let's look at this. A converging lens has a focal length of 20 centimeters. The lens forms a re-inverted image of the same size as the object when the object distance from the lens is what? We have to deploy the equation that relate all this information together. That says 1 over f equals to 1 over this plus 1 over i. Which you often see in books like this. Over u plus 1 over v. Actually, this is the object distance. And this is the image distance, okay? So what we need to do now is to substitute the value here. That is 1 over the focal length of 20 equals to 1 over object distance and image distance. But the question says we should find what? The let's form a re-image of this size. When the object distance is what? Object distance. We are looking for u. But what is b? We are told that what? Same size. Same size. It means the magnification is equal to 1, which means that what? V over U is 1. Okay? That is, if magnification is 1 because of the same side, it means that actually V is actually equal to U. So no need to waste our time. Just come here and put U. Because we are looking for U, we have to let V go. This one is just U1 plus 1 equals to 2 over U. You agree with me now that 1 over 20 equals to 2 over u. u therefore is 20 times 2. If you multiply this now, you agree with me, you're going to have 40. That is 40 centimeter. So 40 centimeter is A. Okay? A is the answer. Let's look at this. It says S rays are very useful in all these except A. In the treatment of cancer and detection of broken bones. Very correct. B, in the investigation of structure of crystal. Exactly. Very correct. In detecting defects in metals. Very correct. In the determination of the lifetime of specimen's age. It's not possible. Lifetime. That is not the work of X-ray. So, this is the answer. Okay? Let's look at this. It says, if calcium has a work function of 1.9 EV. Calculate its threshold wavelength. Assume this is equal to this, and this is equal to this, and this is equal to this. So the first thing we need to do is to convert from electron volts to joules. Okay, that is the first thing. So therefore, because we are already given that this is equal to this, we need to convert this to joules. So that is the first thing you must do when you see this type of question. That is to say, E9 is equal to 1.9 EV multiplied by this. That is 1.6 times 10 to the power this joules. Okay? If you multiply these two, you're going to have 3.04 series to the power minus 19 joules. Okay? 
After that, now we need to calculate the threshold frequency. The threshold frequency. And to calculate the threshold frequency, use the formula that says frequency is this over this. This is Planck constant. That is Planck. Planck's constant. That is this H you are seeing here. DC is the speed of light. That is speed of light. Okay? Why this E is the energy in juice? That is, this energy in juice. All we have to do now is to substitute. So, as you can see in this place, let me put this here. This, therefore, is equal to 6.6 .6 times 10 raised to the power minus 34. times c, which is this, that is 3 times 10 to the power 8, all over this, which is this, 3.04 times 10 to the power minus 19. Okay? Let me get a calculator as just press it. No need to waste my time. So the answer I'm getting here is 6.51 10 raised to the power minus 7 in meter. 6.51. So B is the right answer. Okay? Just use this formula. Make sure you convert first before you continue. With this, you are okay. Let's look at this question. It says the specific latent heat of steam is this. Just a general information. And the specific heat capacity, capacity, of water is this. Now, this is the question. When two grams of steam at 100 degrees Celsius condenses to water at 40 degrees Celsius, the heat given up is what? Look at it. First of all, this was steam. Steam. Assume this steam is in a container. Steam. Hmm? Now, why in this steam level, first of all, condenses. Okay? That is at 100 degrees Celsius, it condenses to water at this. So, it means there are two cases before us. From steam, condenses, then to water. So, we are going to look at the movement from steam to this 100 degree, then to 40 degree. Okay? And while you are moving from this state to another state, you are releasing energy. The energy release first, and the second energy release. That's what we are going to calculate. We had them together. So, the first one is what? It released during condensation. It released during condensation. Okay? Let's work on this. We are going to say the first, this E is equals to ML. What is M? Is 2 gram. We are going to leave it in gram. Why are we not converting? Because this by gram. And if we are multiply these two, that is, let me put the ground, multiply by 2 theory 0, 0 just over ground, it means this and this will cancel. Only this will remain. So no need to convert to kg. So if you multiply this now, you agree with me, I'm going to have 4, 6, 0, 0 joules. This is the first one. The second one is it released during cooling. During cooling. Cooling. Let me just say during cooling so that we we'll know always our time. So we're going to call this one Q2. We're going to look at this as MC change in temperature during cooling. The heat released. Still 2 gram multiplied by specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity of this. Okay. That is 
to this okay from 100 to 40 how many is that that is 100 minus this will give us 60 so multiply by 60 degrees Celsius okay if we work this out now definitely we're going to have 504 joules okay so all we need to do is to add this to that is to get the total now we add this to this plus this okay if we add them together we should have 5104 joules 5104 joules okay that is a is the answer okay a is our answer let's look at this question it says what when a gas is compressed at a constant temperature the gas molecules a gains kinetic energy no increase slightly in size no move at the same speed so that the pressure is not changed no make more impacts by seconds on the wall of the container the gas is compressed in a container of course right inside the container so the gas molecule we make more impacts by seconds on the wall of the container where it is being compressed so this is the answer okay let's look at it it says the half-life of an element is 24 hours what fraction of the atoms has disintegrated in 72 hours we are given the half-life what it means is if this is what we are considering for the first 24 hours half of it will go you get it another 24 hours that is 48 hour whatever that is remaining half of it will go to after another 24 hours which is now 72 hour remember is 24 24 24 we have now here seven half of this we also go to this is what is now remaining so mathematically that was just to show you the way to picture it what you need to do say one is what you are given is one over two of this remember of its times okay i will not repeat that again it's times of one one over two this is what is remaining now again after 24 hours one over two of this of that is of one over two that is one over four another 24 hour is one over two of this okay that is one over eight you have to remove this from what we are given one that is original minus one over eight seven over eight so seven over eight is the answer do you understand i believe you understand because you are preparing for jam okay you should understand this let's look at this it says two equal masses placed two meters apart have a gravitational attraction of this newton compute the value of the masses okay assume g is equal to this what you have to do use the newton laws of universal gravitation we say that what the fall between this object is equal to the gravitational attraction multiplied by the fourth body and the second body all over r square which is the distance between the two bodies assume this is the first mass this is the second mass m1 m2 the distance between their center is and we are told that m1 is equal to m2 so we are going to say they are all equal to m then so therefore we'll come to this place now to say m square because if this m and m are they are equal we can make it like this okay 
R square, okay? Remember, this is G. Now, all we need to do is to make M the subject of formula because we are asked to calculate the mass. So, to get the mass from here now, if you use basic subject of formula, you agree with me, mass, therefore, is equal to the square root of F R square all over G. Okay? Use the basic subject of formula, okay? This and this come together over this, find the square root. Okay, now let's substitute what we have. From what is given to us, you will agree with me that the first is what? F is this, that is 6.67 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 9 multiplied by R square. R is 2, that is 2 square all over G. G is 6.67 10 raised to the power minus 11. That is all. You agree with me that this and this will cancel, okay? And these guys, this over this, is simply take one of the base, use the indices, over me minus, then minus 11, which is plus 11, which is, Minus 9 plus 11. You agree with me? That is 2. So we're going to replace these guys with 2. That is to say now, that is 10 raised to the power 2, I mean. 10 raised to the power 2 multiplied by 2 raised to the power 2. You agree with me? With this square root, cancel. This and this will cancel. Okay? That is to say now, what we are left with is 10 times 2, which is 20. 20 kg. Let's see the answers. Yeah. There is 20 kg here. Hope you understand this. Let's look at this. It says the potential at a point distance of 0.03 meter from a small charge Q is this. What is the magnitude of the charge? Okay. What is given to us here now? It is called Coulomb constant. This is Coulomb constant. So all we have to do is to use this formula that says V is equal to this over R. This is what? The Coulomb constant. This is the electric potential. This is the charge. This is the distance from the charge. Now, what we are asked to find is the magnitude of Q. So, make Q the subject of formula to have this over this. And you agree with me? Our voltage given to us is this. That is minus 1.0 times 10 to the power 5, and the R given to us is 0 0.03. Why the Coulomb constant is this 10 to the power 9, okay? Now that we know this now, you agree with me, if we do this multiply by, can just simply say over 9 straight here? Then this, if we work this out now, that is 5 minus 9, we give us minus 4. That is 10 to the power minus 4. Okay? Let's continue. Now, we can also work on this. Okay? To have minus 3 times 10 to the power minus... We have moved this decimal now. So, we have to add 2 here. That is becoming 6. 1, 3. If you divide 1 by 3, you agree with me, I'm going to 0 0.333 as on and so forth, okay? I just leave it as 0 0.33, okay? Multiply by 10 to the power minus 6. Now, to make it cool, let's move this here. That is 3.3. .3. It means, therefore, because we move this here again, we have to increase this by 1. But the question says what? It says magnitude, mag magnitude, magnitude. The magnitude. We are interested in the value, not in the sign. Whether negatively charged, positively charged, that's not the question. So, because we are asked for the magnitude, therefore, we have to find the absolute value of Q. And the absolute value of this is to remove the sign. The first option is with minus without minus. Confusion. The question says magnitude. 
So this is the answer. 100%. Let's look at this. It says the wave theory of light cannot be used to explain what photoelectricity because light waves do not carry energy. There is threshold wavelength for electron emission. Wavelength of light wave is too short. Particles cannot be emitted by waves. Okay? D is the correct answer. Let's look at this. It says which of the following statement is true for an object in stable equilibrium? A. A boy walking on a tiny rope. That is not true. A balloon on smooth horizontal table. C. A ball resting on an inverted hemispherical ball. A ball in the middle of a hemispherical ball. D is the correct answer. Let's look at it. It says, petrol produces a cooling effect when it is poured on the hand because it has a low conductivity. No. B, high conductivity, no. C, high latent heat of evaporation. D, low latent heat of evaporation. What is this? Because the answer is here. If you pour petrol on your hands, you will feel cold. But if you pour water, no. Why? Because for water, it requires a lot of heat to evaporate. For petrol, just with little heat, it will evaporate. Okay, and also the rate of heat transfer from your hand to petrol is far because petrol has what a low latent heat of evaporation. It requires low heat for it to evaporate. So the little heat you are giving to the petrol is enough to make the petrol to evaporate. And when your hand transfer it to the petrol, it means that what? It has lost it. The giver will lose. Once you lose it, what will you feel? You feel cold. So, this is the answer. Okay? Let's look at this. It says, which of the following observations cannot be explained using rectilinear propagation of light? What is rectilinear propagation of light? It means that what? Light travels what? In a straight line. That is the meaning of what? Rectilinear propagation of light. Rectilinear, reti, linear, on a straight line. A, diffraction patterns of light. Now look at it. If actually light moves in a straight line, when light gets to a little opening, assume this is block, block, a, a little opening where the light gets it's like it's bendy, it's bendy, it's bendy. How do you explain this? This is not longer rectilinear, this is diffraction. So, without wasting our time, A is the answer. Formation of angular eclipse, production of re images, production of images by PO camera. A is a perfect answer. Let's look at this. It says neutrons are used to induce artificial radioactivity because they have no charge. B, have no mass. C, are more energetic. D, are very ionizing. The answer is A. Why? Because neutrons, they penetrate the nuclear. How are they penetrating it? For you to penetrate this, you should not have charge. Because if you have charge, you will be repaired. For instance, say you are negatively charged, I am negatively charged. You are coming towards me. I will repair you. Think of it like that. But for these neutrons, they have no charge. Because they have no charge, they can penetrate deeper into nuclei without being repaired. So because they are not repaired, the electric force that would affect charged particles 
will not affect them. So once these neutrons are absorbed by this nuclear, this will not cause it to be what? To be unstable and radioactive. It becomes unstable. It's like you are, you are deceiving somebody that I am a good person, I am not charged. On arrival, it's causing this guy to be unstable, becoming what? Radioactive. That's why they are used to create artificial radioactivities or to induce artificial radioactivity. Let's look at this. Which of these methods cannot be used to reduce the surface tension of a liquid? A. Addition of detergent on soap. Addition of oil. Addition of alcohol. Reducing temperature of the liquid. This is the answer. Why is it the answer? Say so this liquid. If you reduce the temperature of this liquid, assume the temperature of this liquid currently is, say, 60 degree Celsius. It means the molecules are energetic. Imagine little, little balls, they're energe energetic. While you are energetic, you are not coordinated. You are giving space for the enemy to penetrate you. So the surface will be what? Will be less tense. The tension will reduce. But when you reduce this temperature, for instance, say to 10 degree Celsius, it means the molecule will be less energetic. Thereby, they stick together. And when you are stick together, no more space. Invariably, you are increasing the tension. Let's look at this. It says, a current of 2.0 amps passes through a straight wire in a uniform magnetic of flow density 2.0 that what is the force per unit length exerted on the wire when it is inclined at 60 degree to the magnetic field okay all you have to do you use the magnetic Lorentz force we say that f is equal to the current length b sine theta okay so we are looking for force over length because they said we should find force by length, okay? So that means we have to divide both sides by L to bring this order F. What will be remaining here is I, B, sine, theta, okay? We know I to be 2.0, let's just say 2. Then we know B to be this, which is 2.0. 0, 0.2, let's just say 2 again because 0, 0.0 does not... Okay, let's just say 2.0, there's sine 60. So what is sine 60? You agree with me, if this is 60, this is square root of 3, this is 2, opposite over hypotenuse, okay? Over 2, okay? So therefore, we come back here to say this is 4 times opposite over hypotenuse. If you divide this now, please don't forget to put that is the, the other part of it, I mean before we put sine 60. So let me just include this here so that not throw anything away. So this will give us two, that is two square root of three times 10 to the power minus three, okay? So what is this? When you calculate this, let me use a calculator. The square root of three is simply two times 1.7. Let's just say 1.7 because of the kind of answer provided in one decimal place okay let me put the other one three 1.73 okay so if i multiply this by two now i have three point sorry i have three point four six terrace power minus three okay terrace power minus three let's see if we have anything like that three point four six exactly this in unity pi meter hope you understand this hope you understand this hope you understand this let's look at this it says which of the following characteristics distinguish a p-type semiconductor a 
The majority charge carriers are electrons. B has equal number of holes and electrons. Holes and electrons. C the majority charge carriers are holes. D donor density is greater than acceptor density. Actually, C is the answer. Okay? So guys, if you are watching this video to this end, I say congratulations to you. Okay? And I wish you success. Don't forget to recommend this channel to your friends. And if you have not subscribed, subscribe. If you have any question, do not hesitate to drop it in the comment section. I will reply to you. Again, I say congratulations. Thank you.